So hello, everybody, and welcome to our next master class. I think this is probably our fifth one now, so these have been going pretty well. Um, today we have uh, Steve Sauters and Albert Lowe from Austin Community College. Uh, Steven's been there for a good while now. <laughs> <laughs> 20 20 <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, he conducts the the jazz band and theory and composition and uh, probably some other stuff. And then uh, Albert, I believe you joined right before the pandemic, which is probably not the best timing, but um, that is cor that is correct, Mike. But I am excited to be in Austin. I love Austin. I lived in San Antonio for ten years, so I'm not that far from Austin. Okay. But I'm happy to be back because I worked at um, in the Valley for five years uh, under. Uh, University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. So I'm excited to be back and I'm, I'm thrilled and honored to have the opportunity to um, to meet and chat with all of you. So I'm excited to be here. Yeah, well, very nice good. Well, we'll let you guys take it away. You've got, you can screen share if you need to. You both have uh, guest hosting privileges. Well, I think uh, if you don't mind, we'll, we'll um, let me talk a little, tell, tell you guys a little bit about Albert, um, who is new at ACC. This is his second year at ACC. Um, I know some of you from our jazz activities at ACC uh, throughout the years, and um, we've had a long-running jazz program 30-some-odd years since the early 80s, when, uh, right after ACC was founded. But we, have, we were stuck in some small facilities for a long, long time, decades, um, and uh, we uh, just moved into our brand-new campus this spring, we're going to tell you a little bit about that after uh, Albert does his thing. So we hired someone to come in and build the classical side of the program. And Albert is a, a, a decorated, really well-respected um, wind ensemble conductor. He's also uh, conducted orchestras. I'm going to let you tell, let Albert tell you a little more about himself in the particulars. Um, but we're really thrilled at Albert's, uh, Albert's at ACC now. Uh, he did have the misfortune of showing up in his first year during COVID. <laughs> and so building the uh, classical side program, ensembles and so forth, has taken a little step back because of that. But uh, we're really thrilled about where this program is headed and what's going to be happening at ACC. It's so nice to see some of you who have participated at ACC. Um, and I hope everybody's doing well. And I'm going to turn it over now to Albert and let him... Uh, talk about his conducting topics and rehearsal topics, et cetera. Thank you, Stephen. And um, we're not going to talk about myself a whole lot, but I have been <laughs> for 30 years. But I think what interests me most, and first of all, I want to thank uh, Mike and Thomas for inviting Stephen and I. We're thrilled to be here. One of, the, one of my objectives after I took the position at ACC is to, is to outreach, to meet people like you, to meet the Austin Civic Winds, to meet the conductors, to meet Mike and to get connected with the community in Austin. So this is a wonderful opportunity for us to, to, to exchange uh, in some dialogue. And, and I wanna keep it that way. I wanna keep it a dialogue. It's not a, it's not a, um, a lecture on my behalf, um, uh, so to speak. So I want our time together to be or enjoyable. Have a drink. Mine happens to be non-alcoholic, but it's okay if you have a beer or a glass of wine, or you know, if you wanna vape, do whatever you wanna do. It's fine with me because I want you to be very comfortable. There you go, thumbs up, Mike. Um, I want you to be comfortable as we're chatting about just a couple of ideas that, that, um, that we were bouncing around. When I was first asked to do this, I said, wow, what do I do with a, with a very diverse um, clientele? I have conducted um, a commun several community bands. I conducted the Rural Grand Valley Wind Symphony, which performed at TVA just two years ago in 2019, right before I, right before I moved up to Austin. So uh, we were, had an opportunity to, to perform at TBA the year after Dick Floyd and Austin Symphonic Band performed at TBA. So I was fortunate enough to be in that venue. So I have conducted uh, community bands. I was um, a conductor for the New Horizon Band in Denton when I was working on my, on my doctorate and had an opportunity to conduct a wonderful group of senior citizens. And I did that for, for three years before, before I hung that up. So I do have an idea of what community bands do. And I think we're living in the in an era, I think Thomas and Michael can agree with me that, that community bands are thriving throughout all over the country prior to COVID. You know, we had a really strong group in Houston with Paul, Paul Rossello's group, 
there are several wind ensemble um, groups in this Austin area alone in San Antonio that that I think is, is worth men mentioning. So we're living in a really good time for, for community bands at this point. So we're sad to see that COVID has kind of put a dent, but we're happy that you're here and you're happy, we're happy that you're interested in, in listening to what we have to say because not everything's always exciting as you well know. And of course, having been online and teaching online, we all know the challenges of, of online and distance learning. So feel free to get up, go to the bathroom if you need to. I like to ramble, so I, I think all of us um, feel that uh, you need to just walk away from me. I'm not going to be offended. So, um, so let's go and start by by our by our topic. I was asked to to talk about several topics. Uh, one of the topics is how do you stay motivated? How would you tell your students to, to stay motivated uh, during the pandemic? And it's not just my ideas. I would love to hear your ideas. I'd love to share with you, maybe together collectively we can kind of conquer this, this, um, uh, this, this pandemic uh, era and hopefully by the summer and fall that we can never, we can get things back to normal soon. But in the meantime, how the heck do we motivate ourselves um, in, in, um, during the pandemic? Well, being a trumpet player, you have to, you obviously have to manage your chops all the time. You can't take two, three weeks off like a tuba player. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> or, or, I just hate it when trombone players, they don't play for not for a year to pick up their trombone. They sound gorgeous, you know? Trumpet players aren't like that. You have to maintain. So I don't have to tell you, you, you have a lot of experienced performers in your group that maintaining chops is, is one way to stay motivated dur during, um, uh, during a pandemic. And even if it means picking up your horn every day for just 15 minutes, I think it's important for us to keep our minds focused on music, even if music is not a profession. Right, a good way for us to just cast it aside is just not by thinking about it. So I kept thinking. I said, "What, what can I possibly say to um, to a group of experienced musicians on motivation if, if they don't, if they are not already motivated?" You know, but we all have things to do. We all get busy, right, Stephen? You know, even professors get busy right. and get a chance to practice every so often. So I thought, you know, let's let's look at maybe five or six things that we could maybe could help us a little bit, and feel free to join in. One of the first thing I mentioned to, to Mike when I when I talked about my topic was was uh, instrument maintenance. I think the pandemic is a great time for you um, to to take care of things that that are maybe in need of of, uh, of repairing on your horn. I took the time to to get my horn flushed out. I had my my la my valves relapped, you know things like that that I didn't have a chance to do. I even took some dents out. I have a good friend in, in, uh, in Denton, Texas. His name is uh, Dave Anderson, and he owns a company called Brass Alliance. And all they do is fix trumpets. He, he actually refurbishes old trumpets. He refurbishes Civil War trumpets and, and, uh, and cornets, uh, turn of the century cornets and so forth. And he said that his business quadrupled during the pandemic because people were no longer able to play the horns. So they sent the horns in to get it repaired. So I thought maybe a, a good topic to start during during a pandemic and to keep us motivated about, and thinking about our instruments is to, is to maybe take care of that, that low B flat key in your saxophone that has been leaking for, you know, for a couple of months or, or buying that chip mouthpiece, like taking a look at chip, uh, your mouthpiece and clarinet and says, man, this, I've been playing on this chip mouthpiece for three years. You know, why, why is now is a good time. Maybe perhaps I should be looking out for, for a new mouthpiece. Now's the time maybe I could test out on my sound, but maintaining, um, Music in your forethought, I think, is, is an important start to keeping us motivated. Um, I have a mouthpiece that, that I've been playing for so long that my, my jazz band students last year said, Dr. Lowe, you're going to get brass poisoning if you don't replay your mouthpiece. And I said, I, I don't have time. I'm playing it all the time. Well, I finally got it replayed. I finally got it replayed it over, over the pandemic because it was an ideal time. So maybe it's a good thing for you if you got that couple of dents in your trombone slide. Or that B flat key working, or or if you're you got leaks on your clarinet, you know, or or if your oboe's out of line, maybe now's a good time for you to bring your horn in, you know, have somebody look at it, have it get in tip top good shape, you know, I think will be will be a, a good place to start with, with the pandemic. Any um any comments on that? Anybody have anything to add to 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 uh, to my suggestion? Has anybody done that? Yeah, the horn plays so much better after you flush it out. 
It's amazing. <laughs> You know, after you take that mouthpiece brush on it, you know, but then you haven't put it in pot for four years, you know, you find right. out that, that Snickers bar, of course, you have, have to be a trauma player that responds to that, right? There is a, some <laughs> gross thing growing in there. Yeah. <laughs> you water it occasionally, it'll, it'll blossom. Uh, I I, I'm disappointed that Kent Winking retired and closed shop during the pandemic because he worked on my oh, side really? all the time. Kent Winking at uh, Sand Bass Music. They closed their doors during the pandemic. Oh, no. Oh, wow. I hadn't heard that. So the shop's completely shut down? Mm-hmm. Uh, that, well, I haven't been there. I'm here. I'm telling it to you secondhand, but that was the story I got. Yeah. Oh, well, man. Mike, maybe maybe we should get a list of, of all the shops that are open and make it available for your members if we can do a little research on our behalf. But we, we, do, we could do a follow-up on that, Stephen, right? We can mm -hmm. find out what shops are open, and that would be great. And, and of course, Warren, how many times have you taught trombone to your students and then you, you grab their slide and all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, I can barely even move it. There's so many little things in their slides. And the mm -hmm. fact that they haven't cleaned their slides forever, you know, makes you remind yourself like, okay, what am I doing with my own instrument? Am I, am I keeping my instruments clean? So um, if, if you haven't done so, now's a good time. You know, I think even for woodwind players to get to get repads and things like that. I think it's a great idea to do that. Now, if you have the, uh, the people available for you, like Steven said, they may not be open. So we'll try to follow through with that, you know, with, with, that, um, uh, with that comment and hope that we can find some, some reliable um, uh, repair guys for, for people who want to send their instruments in. So now it's a yeah. good time for that. Um, another thing I thought about that, that I thought was, that really helped me to get motivated was I went back and listened to some old recordings, uh, old North Texas recordings uh, that, and, and tunes that were very dear to me. I thought um, tunes that sort of struck my, you know, tug at my heartstrings a little bit. Uh, Barnes Symphony Number no. Three would be a good example of that. You know, I love, I love uh, James Barnes uh, Symphony Number no. Three, and I, I have an emotional attachment to that piece. And so mm -hmm. I went back and I listened to a lot of those pieces that I haven't listened to forever because. I have the time to do it during pandemic, and it made me, um, it made me feel warm again, you know, about music. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts about that? I listen. I listen a lot. Um, if it's not YouTube, it's in my own stash. And uh, yeah. I'm playing bass a little bit more often these days than I touch my euphonium. But yeah, it's a lot of listening. And then even in my truck when I'm driving, I'm like, oh yeah, so I'll screenshot. Uh, what's on the radio and I know the songs pretty well so I'll, but I'll screenshot to remind myself when I get home to that's what I want to kind of start working out on the bass see if it works out, you know see if I can work it out yeah, yeah. go ahead Stephen uh, you bring up a good couple of good points I, I've done a lot more listening while you know stuck inside uh, but I'm listening to all things that I haven't listened to in 30 or 40 years and um, it reminds me of why i wanted to play music in the first place. You know, I uh, just this afternoon was listening to <clears throat> a Bartok piano sonatina that I played when I was a teenager that made me want to become a composer because I thought, oh my God, you can write music like this. Who knew? Uh, and so, you know, just reminding yourself of why you're interested in music in the first place. Uh, it's a great, great time to trip down memory lane, I guess, um, while we're stuck inside. Um, and uh, Thomas, you mentioned you're playing bass also, and I don't know, I'm not, I don't want to step on any of your topics, Albert, but picking up a new instrument uh, seems Ooh, to be yeah. happening quite a bit. Just like people are adopting dogs <laughs> during the pandemic, people are also adopting new instruments. I picked up an accordion and have been teaching myself accordion during all of this. Um, I've got students who are learning to play different instruments. Um, so yeah, any, anything that re-excites the passion you have for music, you wouldn't, you wouldn't still be playing uh, if you, if there wasn't something about music that just drew you in, right. That meant something to you. Absolutely. That's a great, that's a great idea to pick up a new instrument. You know, I've been always wanted to play harmonica, blow, suck, blow, <laughs> suck, blow, suck, suck, blow, right. That's a, that's a there great idea. We're going to start a klezmer band when we get out of here. <laughs> there you go. So I think that's a great idea to, again, keep you, keep music in the forefront and, and keeping us passionate about music, even I still, I, like Steven said, you listen to that bar talk 30 years later, it still tugs at your heartstring. It's amazing, you know? And, and, and Thomas, you, you know the Barton Symphony number no. three, and you know 
Um, he wrote that, that third movement for, for a stillborn daughter of his, Jim James Barnes, and then named her Natalie. So the, the third movement of the James Barnes Symphony is in, is in memory of Natalie. And every time I hear that piece and it starts with a cello, I just want to cry. You know, I just want to want to ball. And that just keeps me so passionate. Oh, what I want, what do I want to listen to next, you know? And I think that's a great way for us to um, to keep ourselves motivated. And um, the, the other thing I, I had also thought about was, and I, and I spoke to Mike about this too, was how about picking up a solo that you've always wanted to play? You know, I said, you know, I, I thought maybe learn Flight of the Bumblebee, one note at a time. You do that for a couple of days, you know, during the pandemic, before you know me. So I think maybe picking up a solo that maybe perhaps you always thought you wanted to play but didn't have a chance to play uh, would be a great idea. And I think in Thomas, you can only, you can even venture out to different genres of music, right? You know, you listen to jazz and other types of music to get, to get motivated. Oh, no, no, I don't listen to jazz. I'm even. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, and and the and the music I like to play on my bass guitar is more like grunge. Mm -hmm. Oh, grunge! So, wow. so but yeah. the, but that's your passion, right? What is your connection with grunge, Thomas? Oh, uh, so I was I grew up in the nineties. <laughs> grew up in the nineties. Did you grow up in the Portland area? No, no. Uh, I grew up in West Virginia, so it's um, you know we got the music about a year late. <laughs> took a while to travel what's that we're traveling from west coast to east coast well it that takes time to travel from west coast to east coast you know that and they have to get the church's approval before it's allowed on the radio <laughs> I just like that music i just i i like um you know, we have one of our uh, uh, presenters, uh, of an old friend of mine, who was the uh, director of uh, doc uh, training and doctrine for all the Army band. And he, one of the things he touched on was how the, uh, you know, during a certain age frame, that's when you uh, solidify your, your true taste in music for the average person, not, you know, there's exceptions like musicians will venture out more than the average person, but the average person will, you know, sometime about 14 to 16 through about age 29, whatever music was in the top 20, 30, 40s at that time of their life is what they really identify with. And so when I was at that age group, what I really listened to on the radio most was some of the, the later 80s stuff that was still on the radio, but a, a lot of the 90s alternative and grunge from the Seattle scene, even if not from Seattle, but that Seattle scene type. Yeah. Of so in my, you know, outside of playing the euphonium with a lot of bassoon, cello, and, and, and what I would call serious music, that's what I listen to on the side. Wonderful, wonderful. I think euphonium is a very um, flexible instrument. I think it's got great range. I happened to um, had Stephen Mead um, over at Utah GV as, as a guest artist when I when I was teaching there, and and the th things that he talked about what a euphonium can do is absolutely phenomenal. So um, definitely a, a, an instrument that's underrated. But uh, I'm just reading all the chats, by the way. Uh, yeah, Thomas, I think it's funny. Yeah, good. I don't want any more. Great. 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 Just hey Warren, you need getting to hit from all sides. Jazz, accordion, man, I'm just getting <laughs> nailed here. <laughs> so Warren, you're you're a flute player also then too, right? Warren, not just a trombone player, you're a flute player. I dabble in a little bit of every instrument. Are you a band director? Uh, I used to be many years ago. Yeah. He's a recovering band director. Recovering band director. I'm <laughs> most, mostly playing piano these <laughs> days in the jazz band. So, yeah. Very cool. That's yeah. another yes, thing. Yes, Robert, that, an accordion is an instrument. 
<laughs> it may not be a very good instrument, but actually, you know why I, I picked up the accordion? It's the, it's the what I, my point earlier was what was exciting, excites you. Um, I was in, uh, I don't know if uh, Don and Jennifer win the band at that time, but we actually had an accordionist want to play in my jazz ensemble, one of my jazz ensembles at ACC. And uh, he was a very good, good pianist, but he was from Germany and he studied in Brazil and he was a remarkable uh, accordionist. He still plays, Jan Fleming, he plays around town all over the place. Um, and he came in and we played a ballad and it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever heard because when the piano is comping, the sound goes away. But when the accordion is comping, you just get the sustained beautiful chords and the solos sound beautiful. And I was like, oh my God, I'd never even thought of the accordion that way. So three, four, five, six years later, I decided I'd pick one up myself. Wow. And just in defense of, of my adopted instrument. <laughs> and you can make a living playing accordion in Austin. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I, my students play harmonica and he, he gigs full time. He says, that's yeah. why I gig. There are not too many, too many harmonica players left in this, in this country. He used to have a harmonica teacher at ACC back in the yeah. 90s. Yeah, I'm reading. I'm reading War, Warwick Wilson's uh, 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 message. That I had a cord in the back seat of my car, left it in the, on Sixth Street. Well, that's a bad. That's a bad to begin with. You don't leave anything on Sixth Street. <laughs> the window was the rear window was smashed, and three more cordings were left in the back seat. <laughs> they actually added to a supply. They smashed his car and they added three more cordings. You gotta get her, You gotta get them rid of them somehow. <laughs> I thought that was funny. And I thought works if they got grunge music sooner, Brett's Virginia had internet, Thomas. Oh, uh, we, we got it about 2002. <laughs> I think it was called AOL, right? <laughs> yeah, it actually was. Ah. <laughs> you had AOL or CompuServe. That were your choices. Yeah, thank you for all the all the all the chat too. I gotta remember to also check my chat. And there's somebody who uh, loves just... it. Yeah. I just I just put a link up to one of the most beautiful songs that I've ever heard. It's it's basically voice and an accordion. It's it's uh -huh. really a, really beautiful. So if you have if you have a chance, to listen to it. All right, we'll definitely check that out. Definitely. Yeah, is that the link that you got, you got right there? Which which one is it? Yes, sir. It's a, it's the very last one. Oh, that I see I one. I see it. Yeah, I wanted to save that. I absolutely love the accordion, and I and I think there there is a place. In, in our in our for <laughs> accordions. I'm glad this is beginning becoming a forum about, <laughs> about justifying the existence of an accordion. <laughs> Aquarium the accordion forum. If, <laughs> did I tell you we had we we uh, we we accompanied a thurman once? Not not very well, but but, uh, but we did have a thurman. <laughs> awesome. Really, the thurman was like the first original digital synthesizer, wasn't it? Yeah, it was pretty cool. The magnetic field, right? And yeah, yeah. yeah. First electronic. Thing. Yeah. I've never seen one. I've never seen one, but I I, I talk about it in my classes, though. In it's my basically a box music. with an antenna on it. Antenna on it. I know. It, it doesn't look like an instrument. Yeah. That's the thing. <laughs> well, that's fantastic. So those of you who picked up new instruments, I think that's a great idea. So has anybody picked up any new solos? Anybody picked up on my idea of, of picking up something new that they wanted to play um, to, to motivate themselves? I mean, I mean, I just, I took up the Omni, Omni book again. I'm not, I'm not a great improvisationalist. And I think that's something that I would like to learn during my pandemic is maybe I should hook up with Kent, you know, and, and, and work on my improvisational skills. You know, as a high note player, Robert, you know that we ever, ever, never, always, never solo. You know, and so an opportunity to to be a soloist, I think it, it will be my motivation to, to continue to play my instrument because as you get older, and I am older than all of you, you got Robert, you told me you're in the grunge era. I was already teaching by then by that time. Um, is that um, I'd like to I'd like to be able to solo, you know, when I'm 70 years old and I can't play high notes I, and I can't play anything above a G anymore. I'd like to be able to solo. So that could be my goal, Stephen, is, is to... Mm -hmm. Is to learn how to learn how to solo, you know, learn how to solo like the way Kent does. If Kent can do it in two years, you know, I'll put in a little practice time, right, Mike? <laughs> That'll do. So I just found my my new motivation to continue to play my trumpet because I was thinking about doing a piccolo uh, trumpet recital, 
uh, at our new recital hall just because I wanted to test the facilities. Rob, uh, Thomas, it won't be big enough for your 75 piece group that, that recital hall, but we certainly would love for maybe some of those, um, the Austin Civic Wind members to come and maybe do a, um, a little concert for us, you know, or, or to play uh, to play some chamber music for us and things like that. That We, we certainly will welcome that, won't we, Stephen? Mm -hmm. Of course. That would be wonderful. We do have some spinoff groups that are smaller groups that range anywhere from three or four to 20 or 30, so. Yeah, I think the stage can hold four, 50. Okay. I think it's a recital hall, but um, you can still get a decent sized group. It is. It's a very intimate hall. I think you'll like it. And I think it would be nice to to be, because the wonderful thing about our facilities is that it's tied all to recording studios because the sound engineering department at ACC is so large, the MPPT department, that um, we have a lot of technology to record, you know, and I think that that's a great opportunity for, for any of our, our civic groups or our community groups to come in and, and get to get some experience recording. I think that would be a great project, joint project for, for maybe Thomas and I to do in the, in the in the near future, you know? These are the things that excite me. So you can understand that my voice gets gets a little more peppier when I talk about joint projects with Thomas, you know, and I think- uh, Well, Robert is, Robert is the head conductor. He's the guy to uh, arrange these things with. I go along for the ride. In fact, he refers oh, yeah. to- Yeah, um, Albert, you have to be really careful with uh, joint projects with Thomas. He gets you okay. kicked out of, he gets you kicked out of places. Okay, you, you, li you live in- Especially Catholic churches. <laughs> <laughs> you live and learn, Robert, right? That's how you, that's how you figured it out, right? You live and learn. <laughs> okay, think. Robert, then you and I are going to have to do some joint, joint projects together. Sure, I mean, we'd love to have you have you over to 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 the rehearsals and do and do some some uh, some baton waving. Oh, I'm I am just itching because one of the things that I miss the most about the pandemic, and you you can probably. Um, I feel my pain, Robert, is, is, you know, the opportunity to be in front of ensembles. I have a flute choir that I just got done um, rehearsing. I am so excited and thrilled to conduct this five, this five piece group. You know, it's like I'm overzealous about conducting uh, for, for, for a chamber group, but I, I miss, I miss conducting so much. And I used to go overseas a lot. I, I traveled to, to Thailand and Japan and Indonesia quite a bit um, in my, in my business. And I used to go over there a lot before, prior to the pandemic. Actually, last December, I was in Bangkok, Thailand, and I came back, and, and the first thing I heard is that we've got this uh, disease, you know, I mean, this, this virus called the, the coronavirus. And so I just missed it. I just, I just um, got back from, from, from Asia when I heard about the pandemic. So, uh, yeah, I, don't, I won't be going back there anytime soon, but I certainly miss the opportunity to wave my... my uh, my baton, and I'm certainly um, thankful that, uh, of the opportunity for you to even invite me to come and come to your rehearsals. So, Robert, yes, sir. Any um, any any new plans for the, um, for the Austin Civic Wins, and when the when the when the group's gonna get back together? Well, Tom, I sorry. have um, I I um, I don't know if you know one of the smaller ensembles that we've had going in, in some of the summers has been the uh, the bat city brass it, it's a basically a, a kind of like a symphonic brass type of thing and we we extend an invitation to all the brass players in the area so we don't we don't just limit it to 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 Acqui. Mm -hmm. and awesome. uh, and I, I just sent i sent notice that if 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 it's okay with uh with the places that we rehearse in that, that that we could get another one going this summer uh the first time that we that we did this we did uh a, a basically mostly antiphonal uh thing with with a bunch of gabrielli and, and 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 then smaller ensembles and then the second time that we did this we did it with the planets and that was what a year and a half ago or so and uh both concerts i think turned out to be really really or co both concert seasons because we did more than one turned out to be really good. So I sent notice that, that I would like to do that again in the summer if if COVID allows. Mm -hmm. That'll be so, so much, that was so yeah, much brass. I love brass bands, Robert. I, and I dwell into that a little bit at North Texas because uh, um, uh, Brian was there. I knew, he was still teaching at uh, Euphonium and he was he's a big brass band guy. And I got a chance to listen to all the British brass bands. 
And I went, oh. Yeah, we, we, we started one of those in, I started one of those in 2005. And now uh, uh, the, their, their, their conductor now is John Caputo. Mm -hmm. And they're doing really, really well. A couple of years ago, they, they uh, well, they're, they're planning to, to, to actually take a, take, take a trip uh, to, the, to the Brass Band Nationals NAVA. Oh my God, that's yeah. highly competitive. Yeah, we went, for the we went for the first time two years ago. We were planning on going back, but pandemic stopped us. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah, to hear some, some of those, those incredible, incredible uh, British bands. And they, they play. I mean, they're playing woodwind parts on trumpet. And they're playing on E flat piccolos and, 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 B, and B flat piccolos and so forth. And it's, it's pretty amazing. I'd love to be part of that. Robert, if you get a brass band going, I'm in. They're, they're, they're going, they're going. It's, it's the, the, the Austin Brass Band, ABB. Oh, I see Austin they, Brass they Band. They rehearse on Monday nights in the same, in the same place at, at, the, at the same church that, 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 that we rehearse in. Yeah, Albert, I sent you a link about them. So you should have it in your email too. I'd love to go. I'd love that. I'd love to get yeah, involved. I'm, I'm sure that John would welcome you. Yeah, we're yeah, actually down a few cornet players, so we could use John Cornet. I need a reason to practice, you know. <laughs> like I said, that motivation. I mean, I'm I'm doing a clinic on motivation that you know, I I struggle with with practicing sometimes myself. You know, if you don't have goals, it's very difficult sometimes to play. And I think that's why picking up a new solo or learning how to impro improvise during your time or you know, are good reasons, but even better reasons is to find somebody to play with. I think that was the next topic I was getting at in terms of the pandemic. If you can find a partner to do duets, you know, or, or even a chamber group of, of, of trios, I think that's another great way for us to stay motivated and stay playing during the pandemic without having to meet as a full group. You know, I think that's a good idea. I, I invite my students to come in and play duets with me all the time because I, I, I need, you know, I need the um, the opportunity to play with somebody. And I think we all feel that same need, you know, and I think if we don't get that need soon, we'll, we're afraid that we're going to lose that passion to play with other people, you know? So I think that would be my next topic would be is to find um, somebody who even wants to play duets with you. I think that's, that's another way to, to stay motivated during the pandemic is, <clears throat> is to play duets. You know, there are tons of duet books and, and, and if there's, if the brass band is going not, I'd love to be part of it if I can find find in my time to uh, to go to rehearsal. That would be a good reason for for me to get involved with with more of Austin. Like I said, I want want to play the Stevens Jazz Ensemble on Thursday, but I have a class there at that same time. So I just things like that really help us all. So yeah, thank you, Mike, for for sharing uh, that information. And speaking of that, when does Austin Civic Winds Aqui uh, rehearse? Tuesdays, seven thirty to nine thirty. This time, right now. One one day a week. Yeah. Seven thirty, nine thirty, and you guys have seasons, right? Yes, you, you guys have um, certain active seasons, and then. Yeah, we usually start the last week or so of August. Kind of depends on how it falls on the the calendar, and uh, sometime um, mid October. Uh, maybe into November, depending on when we schedule the uh, concerts. We'll have two or three, maybe four uh, performances of that music. It'll be uh, typically a little bit heavier, um, more serious. Uh, then we'll go into Christmas stuff, which is uh, all in a bag. You know, just kind of sure. just pull out the bag, play the music. Um, and that takes us through about, sometimes usually about December 10 through 17. Then we'll have a few weeks off and start back up in January and play uh, about March, April-ish, maybe into May for the uh, spring concert series. Again, that's usually more serious heavy music, just kind of depends. We played lighter stuff too. And then we have the patriotic stuff, which takes us up to around the 4th of July time. And then the rest of July and August uh, off. So really, you guys are pretty much year round. I mean, at least what you're telling me is almost three quarters of the year, at least the way you're planning your performances, you know, 4th of July, spring concerts, holiday concerts, and fall concerts kind of falls into, you know, three quarters of the year. So that's a, that's quite a, a schedule for community bands. Uh, a lot of community bands don't meet over summer as at all, unless they have a patriotic 4th of July performance. But I almost um, would, would, uh, would almost ask you guys to, you know, possibly plan for to play a TBA one year. I think that would be a great idea for, for this a group like this to, to perform in. And TBA, 
and Midwest Clinic are both accepting community bands um, as, as a venue for, for the audience because they want it to be a very diversified convention. And that's something that's always a goal, I think, that keeps community bands going is if they have a, you know, a, a, a goal in performing like, like at the TBA convention or something, maybe a, a bigger venue uh, would be a reason for, for, for your members to continue to practice and to get better, you know? It's always hard to, to try to find that. That's a good idea, Robert says. Uh, you may want to talk about that with your board, you know, and, and pitch the idea to, to Mike, Mike Rashidders, who is the president of, uh, of TBA, because he's the one that came up to me and says, you know, we have never had any groups from the Valley come and perform. Would your Rio Grande Valley Vince, Wind Symphonies perform? And I, I said, I'm, we're all in. And as soon as I pitched the idea to, to my community group, they, they automatically became a different group. They became a more serious group. They said, "Okay, what are we going to play? What are we going to do to represent ourselves? You know, are we going to play, you know, uh, Hispanic composers? What, what, what are we going to do?" Of course, TBA has a strict um, guideline, just like Midwest Clinic, that you have to play the feature composer. Happened to be John Mackey two years ago. Um, sometimes they may have somebody else come in um, uh, to to be the guest conduct uh, to be the guest composer, and then you have to play one of their pieces, and then they always want you to play a local composer, you know, somebody that's, that is from Texas. And so you are, you're limited in your repertoire, but I think Robert, I think it's a great idea for a group like yours to play. And it's not that far of a trip. San Antonio in August, the only difference is that you have to extend your 4th of July perform after your 4th of July performance, some rehearsals going into August. Hmm. What do you think of that idea, Robert? He's it's, a, it's a great idea. Another idea that I that I had was was for us to actually play in Mexico, but that's that's mm -hmm. far different. That's you know that takes a little bit more planning. But we had a we had a member for a while that 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 was uh, with us, and they have a lot of municipal bands that are sponsored by the yeah. state, and they they they're just fantastic. They're so good, at, you know, and and they have arrangements that are that are written for them. They, mm -hmm. It's it's actually just a different. And it's, it's a funny. completely different environment, you know. It's funny you say that because when I worked at UTRGV, which is UT Brownsville, University of Texas Brownsville, we had people coming over from the border, tuba players, that man were just like they're like bond, these banda musicians that can play incredible technique uh, on a tuba. You just gotta gotta hone their sound a little bit, Mike. You know, they're a little blatty, a little yeah. a little distorted. If you can tone them down, they're generally really good musicians. You're right, Robert. That that um, Mexico does have a lot of uh, government-sponsored um, community bands. That would have been a great idea prior to the pandemic. I think with, with the pandemic, it's really, a little more difficult for, for us to leave the country at this point. That's why I suggested maybe TBA. You know, I, I would love Midwest Clinic, but that's a big, long trip you know, in a very cold time of the year. Um, <laughs> and I'm not sure if that, all of us would agree to, to want to go to Midwest Clinic you know, to perform. But they generally love Texas bands. At, at Midwest, I mean, they almost feature a Texas band every year, you know, for that matter. I love, I love um, Caroline Reynolds. Um, there are trios and quartets for water music. So I assume you're a woodwind player, Caroline, right? Do what's for the summertime, if not when rehearsing, to keep the chops up for the fall season. Great idea, Thomas. Um, Ellen says, we need to put some kind of bulletin looking to see what is it, who's interested in playing duets. I think that's a great idea. You know, now we have such an electronic forum Ellen, that, you know, the internet is, is, is such a great tool for us, you know, um, to communicate things that we didn't have just, you know, 15 years ago, you know, I grew up, I grew up in an era, like I said, I'm older than my, all of you. Uh, I grew up in an era when, when, you know, we barely even have cell phones, our first cell phones were this big, you know, I grew up in that era. I grew up in, um, on, with TVs and, and rat and rabbit ears and all that. That's my generation, you know, I grew up in the seventies. Uh, Mike was talking about, and Thomas was talking about music that we all we all hang on to as, as children. My music is music of the seventies. That's what I I love. I love my rock and roll. By the time I get to the eighties, nineties, <laughs> by the time I get to the eighties, nineties, I was already studying classical music, and I said, "Grunge who?" You know, Thomas, I, Nine Inch Nails, what? You know, I, I Kurt Cobain, who? You know, uh, but now that I'm back in teaching American music, I'm, I'm getting back in touch with with the popular music scene of the 80s and 90s. Mike, you have your hands up. No, I was just saying, I, 
I like the like the old seventies rock too. That was my time my time too. <laughs> oh, I grew up around Chicago and Kansas, and mm -hmm. you know, I, I went to Led Zeppelin concerts when I was a kid. We were passing out posters. Every everybody that came into to the concert got a poster. So I hooked up with a poster company, and I saw Pink Floyd. I saw Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. I saw some of the best groups ever, you know. So, so I have my hat to hang on when it comes to rock and roll and listening to some of the greatest. Yes, I even saw Ted Nugent. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not ashamed to say I saw Ted Nugent. <laughs> uh, but but I, and I even grew up listening to my, my older sister's music, which is, you know, the Carpenters and, and Simon and Garfunkel. So I go into the 60s, you know, and I even. And of course, now I, now I teach American music. I listen to Sam Cooke. I listen to a lot of great music. So music motivates me, you know, and I can see a lot of heads, you know, nodding when they said, that's what keeps us all alive is by listening to, to a lot of music. And I think that's, um, that, that, that never is gonna, gonna end. Even, even when I retire and um, uh, someday from my job, that music, that music cycle in my brain will always keep going. And I think that's what we have as, as to save ourselves. Steven. And, uh, uh, Albert, you, you'd mentioned like picking up solos or something, learning something new on your instrument that you always wanted to play, but why not, you know, pull out your flute and see if you can figure out how that the that carpenter melody goes or, <laughs> or sticks or whatever you know uh yeah, working along your ear at the same time is it it's music you love to listen to so why not try and see what you can do uh do just by listening to it and playing on your instruments getting a feel for you know uh yeah anything, anything that motivates you to pick up your horn you know it, it when i when i practice it's it's sort of meditation to some degree, you know, I, I'm just doing enough to keep my chops in shape, da, long tones. And then, da, you know, it's just, it could be as boring as I'll get out, but I tend to just kind of wander around the room while I'm playing really slowly. And just my mind gets in the headspace and I'm just listening and there's not a whole lot else going on. So I actually kind of look forward to that. I don't like practicing. I never have liked practicing. But if I think about it in a slightly different way, I can at least I can at least keep my chops up because unlike what Albert said, trombonist cannot lay off for a year and come back and play <laughs> beautifully. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. <laughs> no, we can't. <laughs> I learned two things from Steven's message. First, this is that he actually warms up. You know, that's, that's... <laughs> one thing that's, about that's not. It's not. I think that's a good idea to to develop your actual routine while you know in addition to working up solos and duets and playing and so forth, but to think about and read about what you need to do as a, you know, I, I, I cool down after every performance I ever play and I'm the only person in whatever band I'm, I'm playing in that does that. <laughs> but if I don't the next day when I play, it's just not going to feel right at all. So figure out how to warm up and how to cool down and how to keep your chops alive when you have, when you're playing some concert where you've got a 20 minute intermission and you got to come back and, and play again. Uh, all, all of that's really, really kind of interesting. Um, yeah. it's a, it's a physiological and, and it's mental and, and so much. I still think trombone players can just pick up their horn and, and play. They don't, <laughs> they don't warm up. We'll, they we'll don't always sound beautiful, but we may only be able to play one note after, after <laughs> maybe a year five off. minutes. It may be five minutes of beauty, but you know, <laughs> with trumpet player, it just doesn't come out. You get <laughs> The fun thing about playing like your favorite tunes on the radio is whatever age, especially brass. Brass love flats. Mm -hmm. When it comes to sharps, we get a little pissy. Yes. <laughs> and so when you're playing your favorite tunes on the radio, a lot of those because they have guitar, guitar they're yeah. gonna they're gonna be in G, A, or some G. sharp. Key. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you know, kind of forces you to not necessarily think about how many sharps are on the staff but if you're figuring out that melody you get your fingers and your ear used to playing in a sharp key mm -hmm. uh, so that's kind of fun I, that's I, that's why i like playing along with tunes like that um yeah you can you can, you can also uh, take your tuning slide and pull it all the way out <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go my horn is no longer in B flat. It's in B. I can play anything at that point. Robert, I don't have a five dollar horn. Mine was. <laughs> I have a. We have a P bone, right? P trumpets, right? That's that's what hey, we're yeah. about these days. I actually sound better than that the other day than I did my own trumpet. 
<laughs> yeah, these I think that so I think so far I love the collaboration that you guys have given me an idea. I'm reading all your chats and I think there's some really great ideas in there as well. Some of you are actually older than I am, so I'm I'm a, uh, I'm a little surprised at that. I thought I was the oldest one in the group, Mike. There <laughs> and um, we got Caroline yeah. Reynolds there. Frank Chicken. Now Caroline says she grew up with the Beatles. What oh, a, there you what go. Year old that was right growing up with the Beatles and growing up. So did you grow up with Johnny Cash also and and Elvis Presley and and those great people and those great wonderful American musicians? Because I would love to have been in there. Just cobble the singer to get to get into a better key. I like Warwick's idea. Yeah. Like, just, you like to sing a lot. <laughs> Singing, you don't have to practice. You can sing anytime, right? You, you carry your instrument with you. And I'm always the best singer in my own bathroom like everybody else is. I, I barely pass. I, I'm 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 afraid to say, Stephen. I barely passed sightseeing in college. So I'm afraid of my own voice. But the point That's is, why. you passed. That's the important. Right. Part. I said, I play trumpet. I don't need to sing. <laughs> well, that's that's the biggest mistake we, in my life. We get a lot of that. We get a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah, because Robert, I took I took a, a lesson from Vince Chickowitz in Chicago, um, at Northwestern, and he spent an hour lecturing me on the fact that if you can't sing it, you can't play it. He made me play an uh, hour, an hour of mouthpiece, Robert. An hour of mouthpiece buzzing. <laughs> no you kidding. paid some top dollar for that too, didn't you? It was a hundred dollars lesson. I, I think I won my hundred dollars back. <laughs> yeah. Hey, well, I, well, I just kind of walked out of there with a tail between my leg, you know. And I did, I did take a few more lessons after that, but boy, you know, I, I just that's when I realized, you know what, if you want to get anywhere in life. You just start practicing, just start practicing, and 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 that's the the best motivation. I've fallen in love with practice at one point in my life, where I would I would practice four or five hours a day. I would get up to I would get up to school, go to the practice room, get all my books, get all my instruments, warm up on my Clark studies, go down and take a theory class at eight o'clock, come back after a theory and go practice some more, and then go down and take my music history class. I would do that. I did that for three or four years, and I absolutely love to practice. Sight screaming, right? Robert says most trumpet. Why is it, why is it that most trumpet players do not like sight, sight, sight singing? Because it's what's that? what's that? Because it makes us look bad. You you it, you know it's, it's it, all about looks and ego, right? <laughs> it does. It's it's because attitude. you can't sing in the in the register that you want to want to hear in. Trombonists have no problem with sight singing because we sing in the register that our horns are in, so it's not a big deal. But trumpet players, like they're used to listening up there, and they can't, they can't produce that. I just think that trumpet players don't have good ears. <laughs> they press and blow, you know. Uh -huh. they, have the, they have the octave key right here. That works really well. <laughs> All you need. I don't see why we should have good ears if, if everybody just has to listen to us. <laughs> yeah, right. You're exactly, exactly right, Robert. I, that, that's, my, that's my way of thinking. <laughs> Our ears are shot sitting in front of you. <laughs> it's a trombonist uh, uh, lot in life. It's trumpets screaming in their ears, at least in the jazz ensemble. Yeah, I know. I, I, I still remember my mom says, go to the basement and close the door. <laughs> I don't want to hear you play <laughs> I had that too, but we lived in a one-story house. <laughs> I know. Yeah, go, go in the garage and play, Thomas. Do us all a favor. Go to the garage and play. <laughs> so that, my, my mama says, why don't you play a softer instrument? <laughs> That's it. No, That's uh, actually, uh, I would like to, uh, number one, I have two questions about the ensemble and the members, some of whom I've met before, some of who I actually know and have worked with in the past. How long have you been playing in the ensemble, number one? And number two, why did you choose the instrument that you're playing now? Was it your first instrument? Is it a later instrument? And, you know, just general, not everybody has to answer, but so Robert's been doing this for 22 years. He said Dorian smells bad. <laughs> <laughs> Robert, do you have a sense of humor? Uh, most cat, I got 10 years with ACWE, all right. Caroline uh, says, most girls were crazy about Elvis, but I headed to college, learning calculus and physics. So why did you wind up in band of all places, Caroline, right? <laughs> band and debate team. There you go. And Mike's been there for 11 years. 1995, yeah. Wow. ACC Jazz Band, way back when Tom Huzak was, oh, well, it hadn't been that long, but K 
catch me. You chose flute because it fit in your backpack. That's pretty smart. That's that's that is a pretty smart idea. There. Of course, <laughs> even smarter cat would have been an oboe player. That fits in your backpack too. <laughs> Bobby says he likes playing around with musicians, so he plays drums. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. You know, I remember. Um, I remember being told by my parents that you, I have a twin brother, a fraternal twin brother. So we're the same age. We're going to the music store this weekend. You get to choose whatever instrument you want. And man, I was like torn all week. I was like, do I want to play clarinet, flute? My dad and my mom played saxophone. Do I want to play tuba? Don't what? So we walk in the, the store and you know, there's a glass counter right, right by the front doors. And my brother walks up, picks up the first instrument on the counter. It's a trumpet. He goes, and he says, this is what I'm playing. <laughs> and I pick it up and I go, and right next to it was a trombone. I pick it up and go, and I'm like, this is what I'm playing. And that was all the thought I gave to, uh, gave to the instrument. And, you know, I'm, for those of you who know me, I'm a rather short man. Uh, and my arms are not particularly long. I couldn't reach seventh position until high school. Um, I just tied a rope to my wrist and flung it out there and snapped it back. Uh, but this is built for trombone. So it really didn't matter. It, I, I can make a beautiful sound on it. And uh, I know uh, I have a younger uh, sister who wanted to play percussion. She wanted to hang around with musicians, right? And uh, they let her try percussion, but they said, you know, we really think you should play a different instrument. And so she played it for two years and that was that she gave up. It wasn't the one she wanted to play. So um, how did, did everybody else like fall in love with your original instrument or was it forced upon you <laughs> by uh, overzealous parents or what? Uh, folks ah. are, folks are, they're too afraid to talk. So they're, they're typing it out. Yeah, I'm trying to read it all fast. Okay. I grew up. I grew up in, in Puerto Rico. I, I, I was born and raised in Puerto Rico, so I grew up listening to salsa bands. Ah! Oh wow! Trumpets, you know, trumpets was a shoe in for me. That's what I wanted to do. Yeah. So you're like Arturo Sandoval, Robert? Uh, yeah. No, not not quite. <laughs> not quite. Sax was cool. I, Sax I, was I, so I, cool. That's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Even if your B flat key doesn't work, right? It's still cool, right? <laughs> Yeah, I, I also, you know, Mike Bells has started Trump at a terrible idea, band director suggested too. But see, anybody who's ever a band director knows, Stephen, they give you the trumpet mouthpiece first. And you can't make a sound, it goes, here you go, young man. Here's a bigger, here's a bigger mouthpiece for you. And that yeah. time you began playing trombone. He worked on it. can't yeah. make a sound on a trumpet, they go strictly to trombone. <laughs> or euphonium, mm -hmm. right, Robert? Easy. Plenty of Easy. school instruments. Easy. I, I, I only put people on the euphonium when I didn't have a choice. <laughs> when you all you had to have a euphonium, but euphonium is a beautiful, beautiful mm -hmm. instrument. It looks nice. I, yeah, it is. Well, hi, Caroline. Hi, hey, I've got your video. Awesome. Yeah, I've got it. I can go either way. <laughs> Look at that. She's That's just awesome. She's just a young lady listening to the Beatles. That's all she is. That's Caroline. <laughs> well, Caroline, what do you play? If you don't mind me asking. Uh, a clarinet. Um, clarinet. Yeah, Selmer clarinet. Uh, 1939, like Benny Goodman, and uh, somebody else has one in the music museum in uh, out in Arizona. You ever see a C melody clarinet made out of metal? Yeah, well, I don't know. That, I think I had a silver bet. Yeah, I, thought just I, I read that. That was a World War II invention, a C melody clarinet. My sister, yeah, and my sister just found one in a thrift shop up in Maine and gave it to me for my birthday a few years ago. Oh. They, they, make, they make wonderful lamps. Yes, I, <laughs> I kind of put it in a plastic box and put it on the shelf. <laughs> so Carolyn, let me ask you, is your clarinet in good working condition? Do you have, do you have good pads? Yes. And your mouthpiece is in good shape? Yes, made well, by... for you. <laughs> yeah, I had to replace it. I, I won't play them with a chip. There you go. Yeah. You'll be amazed how many people do play with the, with the chip. And that's not. Well, I, I had uh, a guy named Ralph. Got to think. I want to say Ralph Walker. I met him at uh, up in Chicago one one December. I had a I had a mouthpiece from him, and he he's passed on now. I got one from when it broke. I 
got one from someone else. That was. Yeah. Wow. He he was the one that looked at my clarinet and knew, and told me about it. It's uh -huh. a, it's a it's a balanced tone. A balanced tone. Yeah, it's about a 1936. Yeah, I've, Selma. I've never heard of it. Now I was hoping you would have a, a, a Selma Paris model because those are really really good clarinets. And remember those old Paris, Selma Paris. It, models? This is from Paris. Oh, wonderful. And um, it was yeah, it's pre World War II, and it, he he looked at. I had bought it at uh, Straight Music here in town when I decided to get rid of the one I had been playing since high school. And uh, I went in and played it and it, it it went from register to register easily. It's played in tune. It had a lot of things going for it. And I just, you know, I was playing it and it was mine and didn't think much about it. But I, this man up in, uh, at the the music convention up in Chicago in December. He oh. took one look at it and he said, do you know what you have? And I said, no. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he had worked for Selmer. Oh, so he knows. He, he, he knows knew. History. Yeah, he, he, knew yeah right he started saying, he said, that was what you would have played if you'd been in the symphony in New York City. And wow. I had just, I, somebody here in town must have, it must have been part of their estate or something. And I, yeah. I looked about, into it. Once in a while, you get fortunate enough to find an instrument like that, you hang on to it. Not mm -hmm. only are they collector's items, but they're they're very rare to, to find the them. Music teachers look for them for their students. Yeah. Just just like a violin teacher would look for a Stradivarius, you know. I mean, it's, it's, it's the same. It's the same thing. You can find or an old uh, Selmer saxophone, right? You know, the old Selmer Selmer saxophones are great too. So you hang on to that and make sure nothing happens to that instrument. Make sure it doesn't get anywhere near Thomas or Robert. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I found I have a a vet that I picked up at a garage sale for seventy five dollars. Some somebody here in the neighborhood had played it in high school, and boy, I I don't know what they did to the mouthpiece, but it had a it had a real divot. I never. Wow. But that's my second. I find I've, old piece. I found an old bugle. Um, uh, an old drum and bugle core bugle at a garage sale. It's bought for ten dollars. I still have it in my closet right now. Yeah, it's a people. Mouth, it's a mouth rotor, Robert. Have you ever seen one of those? <laughs> <laughs> Very rare instruments. I and mean, if I could, if I could pull it out, I'll show it to you in a second. Okay, yeah, what's Alan, what does Alan have to say? Alan says my older brother started a, an old beat up old cornet, but switched to trombone. For a few months later, he got braces. That just <laughs> happens to a lot of people, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it does. You know, you wear braces, you go on trombone. <laughs> so. But well, that's a wonderful story, Caroline. Thank you for sharing that story for, with us. I think that's sure. That's what I love about community band members is that they come with they come with these wonderful histories. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, I would love to see your instrument. And if I do come to rehearsal, you have to show it to me. Okay, great. Right. Deal. Or maybe, or maybe I'll bring it out and you can show it to your class. That well, I, if I had students, I would show it to them. But I don't. <laughs> <laughs> We have no students. We have a $25 million facility with no students, Caroline. I know. I have friends with Nora Comstock. Comstock. Okay. So you know what's going on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've been watching. We went out there and voted. Oh, you did? Yeah. yeah. Well, but, good for you. Good. For yeah, you. that's a different view. Yeah. <laughs> that's, they've really made something out of that shopping center that was getting yeah. long you, in the tooth. You wouldn't recognize it now. Carolina, you no, probably it's, it's, you I'm, I'm waiting to come see. Stunning transformation, yeah. Like I said, I'm looking to, forward to do some joint projects with with Robert and Thomas and and and, and everybody in Acme. You know, well, I think it'll be a wonderful partnership. Dr. Do they Lewis. still have those? Um, oh, Plaza is not the right word, but there's two or three meeting places in the mall. What about it? I, I was going to say it might be a place you could have a larger size band or mm -hmm. a more public. Oh, yeah. We have several, several repurposed rooms that I think we can use for, for facilities. I yeah. don't think facility is going to be our, our issue at, 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 um, at Highland at all. It's the acoustics won't, make, won't be as good, but it'll yeah. be interesting. Yeah. So. It's, just, it's just nice for, for the one ensemble to play someplace different, you know, just to change mm -hmm. the pace of anything. Uh, the first the first public concert I played after I started playing with uh, 
Austin Symphonic Band was in the uh, Capitol on Halloween night. Mm -hmm. oh. So you played in the Symphonic Band with Dick, with, uh, Dick Floyd? You played in this group? Actually, this was when uh, Randy Bass was there. Oh, Randy Bass. Okay, that's a while ago. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've been around a long time. <laughs> I didn't know. Randy, Randy was in was at UT in the 70s, right? Yeah, right. that would, I guess that was either 79 or 80. Yeah, I, I remember I remember Randy well uh, in that era, that era. And that was the, anybody can play in the, in the Capitol Rotunda. Yeah. You just have to cool. show up. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that can't you can't do that nowadays. They would call. Uh, that. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> hey, Doctor Lowe, have um, you considered having um, the college there host a community band on a certain night where maybe you would be the conductor and they use the facility, but it would be open to ever how many players you can hold? I, mean, I, I, I asked that because when I was at Marshall. We had Monday night band. It was community band. It started at six or six thirty and went for two or three hours. Um, but we had a lot of folks from the community come in, which um, also give opportunity to some of the high school students to play a little bit more music, maybe adva more advanced music than what they were used to in their high school setting. Mm -hmm. So that might be something that you could, um, you know have your facility participate in. We've, we've certainly discussed that option because I think that's a good way to get everybody um, more familiar with the facilities at, at, at Lake at, at Highlands, right? And we have, we have thought about that once we lift the pandemic just to have something like that. But again, it's better to communicate with everybody in the community because there are already so many community bands. You yeah, know? Well, so what my, my thought would be if it was, especially if it was on a different night, more of our folks would have a second ensemble, which would mean twice the music that they would be reading. And, sure. and some, for some of them, twice the amount of time on their horn. <laughs> right. <laughs> they, can only they, they can only benefit all that as all, right? <laughs> yep. Yeah, I mean, I think yeah, we do. Uh, once the campus is open again to, uh, you know, to everybody, um, we are planning to, you know, not only host community groups, but high school groups and so forth, you know, one of the biggest thrills of my young musical life was I was in high school, a freshman in high school, and uh, I was already getting into jazz. And so they invited me to the, the college jazz ensemble played at all the basketball games, but they played real jazz. It wasn't a pep band. And so they said, anytime you want to come out to a game, you could sit in with us. And I, I sat in every freaking game they played. Uh, <laughs> and it was so exciting because it was I was the music was challenging to me. Uh, it was college level. Um, you know, we were playing Maynard for, back in the 70s. We were playing Ferguson and Woody Herman charts and stuff that I never got to read in high school. And so it was just absolutely thrilling. Um, yeah. And, you know, Baltimore Symphony does a, an adult band camp. I don't know if you guys ever heard of that, where you go for a week and you play next to the, the Baltimore Symphony member their members play and like I'm, I, I would be sitting next to the, one of their, their trombone players playing the same part with them. And they, uh, their conductor comes in and uh, it's not just a, like a fluff kind of thing, come use our facilities. But I think that would, could be really interesting too. get some of the top, uh, get some like high profile Austin musicians. You know, we've got tons of jazz, jazz folks here for some reason, there's not much of a jazz scene, but we have a ton of really phenomenal jazz players. We have a ton of phenomenal classical players and uh, invite community folks to come out and do a concert with some of uh, both ACC connections and um, UT people and so forth. Could be really interesting. Yeah, I think I think Thomas hit it on head when, when he says, you know, invite people to come to our facilities and, and this will be a great way to start since we don't have kids, you know, to, to I, I would certainly welcome anybody from, from uh, from the one ensemble to come and play. I just do. I just don't want to be accused of taking members from one ensemble to another one. That's, that's <laughs> just don't have it on Tuesdays, and you'll be good. Yeah, we will schedule a different night. There you go. Yeah, I, I, I think there's already some resentment with Kent, so I don't, I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want. I don't. I don't want to step on any toes here. But we will certainly welcome any any of the of the one ensemble members to come. And we have some very young groups right now that even if they want to play now, we could probably accommodate them if they if they want to choose to, to do some more playing but that certainly is it's is really high in our priority list thomas 
to do uh, once once the campus opens up. And I'm and I'm telling you when when I, when they let the when they let the floodgates open, I am you're gonna see a lot of me everywhere. Yeah, you know, it's um uh, schools everything. Yeah, it makes it makes kind of a good segue to my part of tonight's uh, conversation uh, about the direction ACC is heading and our new facilities. You know the 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 building that we're in now. Oh, Robert Laguna raised his hand for something. Do you want to? Yeah, just... I, I I had a couple a couple of questions, and this is probably for for both of you. Uh, Warwick ha actually had something in the in the chat that I, that I would be ah, okay. to to answer, and and it's it's really about collaboration systems online and, and you guys might might have a much better take on this because we've we, uh, this is something that that we have been going around you know uh as a as a as a board our board's been going around with this you know for for uh you know for a long time and then the second the second piece that i wanted to bring forward is that many of the members of, of acqui might remember that that we had actually commissioned a piece for um for us, you know, by a composer, and and it just it, it, it kind of flailed because because the composer just had a, a, a some life life events that, that happened and it prevented him from completing it. But but we the the, the idea was to to actually write a concerto grosso for jazz band and wind ensemble. Ah. and so I had, I had <laughs> thrown like that out there, yeah. you know. Because I, I I've never heard one, uh, you know, and and uh, and rather than actually saying, well, jazz bands over here, and wind ensembles over here, because you know, one of the things that the that the that the band, the uh, you know, every now and then they kind of they kind of ask for swing swing tunes, and and I'm saying I'm not gonna do that. I, I you know, because I'm sorry, but but wind ensembles swinging sounds cheesy. It it, it does. You know, and it's yes. and, and it. I, I I don't know why. You know, but but it does, and so I don't I don't want it. Uh, you know, I, uh, but but I I absolutely of course respect you know the, the the jazz world and and you know for us to actually you know you know play something like like Basie and stuff like that is is out of the question. You mm -hmm. know, so yeah, I've, anyway, I've not, played on a few occasions uh, mixers of jazz and classical. I remember in college, Clark Terry came when we played at TMEA um, with my university uh, concert band, uh, and that was a blast. It was a, it was a little jazz combo, featured the sax uh, along with Clark Terry, um, the sax, our sax instructor, and a couple of students who who played in the rhythm section. Yeah, uh, it was Clark, not Clark, Perry, a, Clark Perry's just a slouch. He doesn't know how to play. Yeah, it. he was. <laughs> and he's, yeah, and he's he probably not a nice guy. He was so difficult yeah, for him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, he was one wonderful human being in addition to being a wonderful trumpet player. Very funny, um, very funny. Very yes, funny. he probably did because we were eighteen and nineteen. He probably couldn't tell all his jokes at that point, but um, but he seemed like a really wonderful guy. Yeah. Um, did, he, did he do mumbles? No, I don't remember that at all. Uh, if you if you if you ever listen to Clark Terry, just bring that. I'm, I'm saying, telling telling the group, check out Clark Terry mumbles. You'll you'll love that. Fun. I'm gonna have to check that out too, Robert. I I'm a big fan of Clark Terry, and, and one of my favorite albums is, is an album that I got in Europe in Germany that I couldn't find here, and it was a live Clark Terry with an orchestra. And if I could share that with Stephen, I, I would go and share it. It's gorgeous. He played the, a version, a beautiful rendition of Misty, and it had all these string parts in it. And it's great. So I think that collaboration would be fun, Robert. It yeah, would be. Yeah, yeah I, I, I love and that. Frank Kenton experimented a little bit of that in, in the in the sixties with the symphonic bands, <laughs> neophonic bands, and so forth, using mm -hmm. metal phones and things like that. So it's certainly not out of the realm for a for a, for a, somebody to commission a, a, a jazz tune. We have some of those uh, Kent and Christmas arrangements that have mellophone and so forth in them, too. Just throwing that out there in case you wanted to build a little program around the whole jazz band. Yeah, maybe uh, Thomas, could you start uh, your 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 work on mellophones, please? <laughs> <laughs> Can you pull them out of the closet? <laughs> well, Warwick, 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 Warwick Wilson's talking about an online collaboration. Yeah, right. So. We did not have to do that. Uh, you know, the, the, the big issue last spring when we, everything shut down, we had two weeks to put our entire uh, college and everybody else in the country too online. Um, 
we uh, lag time was the big problem, right? So if we're all singing together, like in my sightseeing class, or, or we're all here trying to sing parts, then I'm not going to hear everybody's part at the time that they're singing it. And it's going to be different for everybody. So that's what works uh, asking about, I believe. Um, but luckily, I think for us, at least, I guess I say luckily for me, really, um, by this fall, we were allowed to get into bigger spaces with smaller numbers of people and spread out and go through other COVID protocols. Our saxophonists play with their instruments in bags. Our uh, uh, All of the horns play with masks that have little duck bills that come up and allow you to put a mouthpiece in. Um, and the, the brass cover their bells. Um, so, but we haven't, we haven't had to try and uh, create uh, an ensemble, online ensemble with, uh, with there, there's been a lot of software that's coming out, come out over the last year that fixes that. Have, uh, Warwick, have you had, uh, any experience with those programs? Okay. <laughs> I, I, yeah, sorry. Wouldn't, wouldn't unmute. Um, I, I've messed with, I messed around with Jam Kazam. Actually, I, I played with that for a, a a couple of years uh, again my, my background is more software development huh. and so what they're doing is is intriguing for exactly the issues that you're talking about that, mm -hmm. that the real world latency intrudes when you're trying to play with people who are 600 or, or a couple thousand miles away and right. uh it, it but the the jam kazam stuff jamulus is another one called sonobus mm -hmm. um that they they're actually pretty good um there's some really cool samples of of how people can use jamulus really effectively live um what is the it's better in europe because they have better infrastructure for their internet setups uh-huh so warwick what it, what it was the what was the um, the equipment that the students were using and what was the format of the recording through this uh, collaboration system. So, so there's there's not technically a recording. You you're literally playing like it's it, it's kind of like looking at a, uh, a, a a software mixer. I don't know if you've used like Reaper or Ableton or you know Pro Tools or whatever, but you see something like that, and you you use a uh, a, a uh, audio interface microphone and play into your to your laptop that, that's the that was the issues that we were having when we tried to do this last semester was nobody had the interfaces you know and yeah. nobody knew what to buy and so we had all these different qualities of sound people are recording it on their iphones some people are recording on their computers and the quality was awful and that's why we never did a, a collaboration ensemble was because we could make it this we couldn't make it sound good uh, so i'm cu always curious to see what people are using. Now, have you looked at Adobe, the Adobe Cloud, Warwick? No, I, I, I don't pay for software like that. We don't either. We are already ACC. <laughs> We're giving it. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they do have several, I think, um, several softwares for collaboration or, 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 um, or collaborative um, um, uh, work. And uh, I haven't touched on that a little bit. Um, our dean, um, Tom Neville, Dr. Neville is, is a big proponent of, of Adobe, and we do have a, a licensing agreement with Adobe. And so we all get uh, the iCloud, uh, the, the Adobe Cloud, um, absolutely for free. So I'm, I think there's some really good uh, workable tools within within the student body. That's, that's the thing that will solve the problem of everybody using the same equipment. You know, if you all had Adobe, um, the Adobe Suites, for ten dollars, a student can get an Adobe Suite at ACC, and they can have all access to everything from Photoshop to to uh, what they call Adobe Audition, which mm -hmm. is kind of an audition tool. It's pretty cool. You should you should check it out. Work if you get a chance. I know you don't pay for um, um, software, but you may want to get on Adobe and, and maybe do the free trial and let me know what you think. I'd love to hear about it. In the meantime, Jamalus or Jam Kazam is something that I will definitely. Uh, look into and see what, what we can do because I, I think I think we need to learn as as music educators and conductors and musicians that we need to learn about about these technology the new technologies are coming out because they're coming out so quickly, you know. They are. 
aren't they, Stephen? Yeah, and I think you know the silver lining to all this is that we're being forced to learn, which is sometimes most of the time the case when you're actually sure. learning something. But we're being forced to learn some new technology and things that will help even when we get back face to face, hopefully in the fall. Um, but there's no reason that we can't incorporate you know the lessons we've learned over this past year to make even the face to face uh, uh, better. So. Yeah. I, I want to continue to record work even when we go face to face. I want to be able to learn how to do that. And I want our students to learn how to do that, to have that type of technology skills at ACC, you know? So, I mean, I'm, I'm so, I'm, I'm so proud that Caroline Reynolds is with us on, on you know, on, on Zoom meeting and, you know, and she's, <laughs> she's a little bit of a, of a generation above us, but you know what? She's hanging in there and she's learning. Have you learned a lot, Caroline, since, since the pandemic? She has learned a lot. She's still on mute though, but she's uh, yeah. there. You go. <laughs> yeah, I'm the I'm the laggard in the family. My husband's <laughs> software. My son designed iPhones. So not yeah. iPhones, but all the others. Mm -hmm. so, so you're more technology advanced than most people, right? The, uh, of, yeah. of age. I have good consultants. <laughs> good for you. Good for you. And that's because you live in Austin. Yes. You, this is a town. If you ask at a at a a get together, you can find somebody that can help you with almost anything. Yeah, I, I believe that. I, I truly believe that. You know, I, I think I think this is a wonderful place. That's why I'm so excited to be here. Even though I, I took the job in the middle of a pandemic. I mean, after <laughs> the pandemic started, um, I'm still excited to be here. And and my flames have, have have not dimmed since I've been here. I am more excited to meet all of you, and I'm more excited to get our program started than ever. You know, and I and I can't wait. To come and hear a live group, you know, like 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 Ackley perform, even though it is the first rehearsal. Thomas goes, you may not want to come come to that first rehearsal. Yeah. You're excited because you don't have any students. Once the students are there, you'll be pulling the hair out. Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. I have I have I, I still have a couple of chamber groups. Don't forget, Thomas. I'm pulling my hair on those too. So. <laughs> El Ellen mentions that she's been playing with an application that essentially accompanies her, and that's uh. That's a, that's a great idea too, for keeping yourself interested and, and keeping your chops up. It yeah. makes it feel more like you're actually playing music, right? Than just scales or whatever. That's a great idea, Ellen. And Ellen, it's a lot more fun. It's kind of, it's kind of fun playing, playing, you know, almost playing by recording, right? Having the accompaniment. I think smart music does a lot of that too. Mm -hmm. If you're fortunate enough to get some, uh, to have the soft music uh, subscriptions. A lot of real fun solos. You can go back and play middle school solos. We can play master them all. You know, you can play all, all you can play 10 solos in one day, you know, with the, with the smart music subscription. That's a great idea. And thank you for sharing with sharing us with that one. I think that's a great idea to also play with some accompaniment. I think there's some free ones too, Stephen, if I'm not mistaken. If you dig hard enough in the internet, I think you can find some free accompaniment um, uh, programs out there. Here's a link. Uh, here's a link. To a big band for Santa Barbara City College playing the concert online using Jam with the Zoom. Uh, uh, nice. Earn their home streaming the parts in real time. Oh, streaming the parts in real time. So I've seen a number of those performances. Really they're awesome. Yeah. But the fact that they're doing it in real time is. is I was going to say, that says a lot for the, for the musicians. I don't think our musicians can play in real time. I don't think <laughs> what real time is. A metronome is that. <laughs> Uh, Ellen says that would be interesting in free programming also. The more ideas, the better. Well, Ellen, we'll, we'll, we'll look into it. I, I'll make a note of that. Um, one is to maybe look for, uh, for repair guys that are, that are in business. And the other is to look for software for Ellen. Software for Ellen. And, and if I could, I'll sure speak those ideas over, over to Robert and Thomas and Mike so that, that we can share with uh, everybody else in, in the ensemble. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, we will we will sure stay on top of that. I'm still trying to mess the melody shop, Thomas. Go slow. <laughs> <laughs> so one of my conducting techniques is to take everything twice as fast. There you so Robert, go. <laughs> last time I performed this, it's been uh, four or five years ago, but uh, um, Robert gave me a taste of my own medicine, but it was good. I think I think with melody shop, the faster you go, the easier it is to get to the end without having to breathe. <laughs> yeah, and you know what's funny? No breath. It's That's funny good. you say that because Brian Bowman played it like literally in two, three breaths. 
he did it um, in, in, his, in his retirement concert in North Texas. He, he, he played my melody shop by memory, and he, I swear to God, he, he had taken maybe no more than two breaths. To play that thing. <laughs> Amazing. I actually do that. I use that same technique, and I for ser- seriously, yeah. because I want I want my player jazz as 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 much rhythm, if not more rhythm than chord and uh, uh, pitch. So, and a lot of us from the where we come from, rhythm isn't taught. Pitch is. Don't don't miss the note. But if you're slow on those quarters, well, you know, no one tells you about that. So, um, but jazz is all about rhythm. There's a rhythm section that plays lots of notes, but their primary goal is to create this rhythmic swing, excitement, and so forth. And the horn parts are written to, to add to the rhythm. So we'll play very, very fast sometimes. Uh, and I say, I don't care if you miss the notes. I just want to hear the rhythms there so that you can hear how your part, our percussionist is nodding there, <laughs> how, how those parts work together to create a rhythm that, that helps, you know. Robert helps also says that the wrong notes don't last as long when you play that fast. <laughs> That's true too. <laughs> it's not well, a bad feeling. I'm, I'm really, really glad that you made that point because the ensemble has heard me say that a thousand times. Mm-hmm. Because it's, it's really, if you, if you improve your rhythm, you can sight read a lot faster. If you sight read a lot faster, then you can work on the stylistic issues of a, of a work. The notes will come, you know, as, a, as people play it, then, then the right notes will fix themselves. Yeah. But if you, you start off with the wrong rhythms, it's horrible. You learn, you learn it wrong, you know? It's, mm-hmm. So the, the first thing way- is, is rhythms. The and best way to learn how to read fast is by, by, by rhythmic reading. You're absolutely right. I, 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 I profess to that, to that philosophy as well, too. I didn't if you're not in the right out. place, you're going to be, everything sounds fuzzy. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter if you're in the right note if it's in the wrong place. Right. Right. <laughs> not going to sound good, even if it's the right note. You know, might as well play the, I, I always think of playing the bass part on a, on a flute or something. Yeah, you know. That's a, that sometimes is a fun fun thing to do is to play bass bass lines on a flute, but uh, you know you're looking at somebody who couldn't read music until he was 19 years old. I I was an architect major in my first year in college. I didn't switch to music to my third year, uh, and I was on a full ride at University of Illinois for uh, uh, for for architecture. And um, so I couldn't read music at 19 years old, and I learned to read through rhythm books. My 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 dean sat me down and says. Every day we're gonna read rhythms, the Louis Belson books, things like that, uh, rhythmic books that are really helping my reading. Now I teach a lot of students at ACC who can't read music how to read, and it's really fresh in my mind a process of reading. Uh, the other thing that students don't do is that they don't move their eyes; mm-hmm. they, they stare at whole notes. You know, they don't they don't look ahead. So I'm teaching our new saxophone player, um, um, that uh, the young man that just came in, how to read music and. I do that by the old, remember the old Evelyn Wood speed reading course? Mm-hmm. They, would, they would push your eyes, they would push your eyes forward. That's what I do with notes. And that really helps our students read a lot. So I grew up in the Evelyn, Evelyn Wood speed reading course, you know, just goes <laughs> go across like this and you better read those notes fast. And so, yeah, I think that, I think rhythmic reading is, is definitely the way to go. And like, like Robert says, the, notes, the wrong notes don't last that long when you go fast. We need to make sure Stephen's got some time to show us the new stuff. Yeah, that's right. right. Well, I won't take a whole lot of time. So, but I would like to tell you, thanks, Mike, uh, a little bit about where we're headed. So, the uh, the new campus that we're on, which is with the old Highland Mall, and we're in phase two, what's called phase two, uh, phase one, uh, two of the north buildings, the old J.C. Penney's, and I'm not sure what the other one is, um, opened up a couple of years ago. But phase two is uh, four football fields worth of space for 23 departments. All of the fine arts have moved on to Highland campus this spring. It's the first time ever. You know, we've tried to do collaborations with the dance department who was down at Rio Grande while we were up at Northridge. And it just, you know, when you, especially at five o'clock in the evening and there's rush hour traffic between you and the classes you're trying to get to, it doesn't work really well. So the fact that we're all in one building now, uh, we're really looking forward to that. But even more importantly for the music department, we, uh, for 20 years now, we have been teaching in a building with two classrooms, uh, a lecture hall slash uh, 
uh, Don and Jennifer have played in that hall many times. That was designed as a dance studio, and that, that's that's both our rehearsal space and our performance space, and the acoustics are not, you know, that, and then we had one piano lab, and that was it. We had four rooms for our entire ACC music department, which has uh, probably about 100 majors, music majors, uh, in, in a school year, so um, we've been uh, toughing it out for a long, long time. So all of a sudden we're in this new place. I brought a little slideshow. It's like showing, you know, when I was a kid, you had to go watch your parents' friends' vacation uh, pictures. I hope you don't get bored. I made it really short, <laughs> but um, just so you can see the space. So now we have a beautiful recital hall. It's designed for music. Uh, it's acoustically beautiful. We have a band hall, choir halls. We've got all the classrooms and practice uh, uh, studios we need. Uh, we have um, theory rooms and anyway, we have the facilities that we finally uh, have been working for so long for. So with that, along with our new Dean, along with the hiring of Albert, our plan is to get NASM accredited, which is the National Association of Schools of Music. There are only 15 community colleges in the country who are M NASM accredited. And what it requires basically is that we're teaching not just a two-year associates, but a two-year associates that is literally uh, the first two years of a four-year degree. We are in Austin, Texas, where, you know, there are creative people of all types all around us. We're in the best situation ever. We could certainly become one of the premier community college music uh, programs in the country. Um, we have all the natural resources right here in Austin. And so this will allow us to move that forward. Um, so, uh, our programs have been redesigned. We have new uh, degree plans for our, uh, our students who are planning to transfer to four-year programs. We see a big future because college is so expensive uh, of a lot more students coming through, taking two years at community college before transferring to a four-year program. We are literally our tuition. I'm, not, I'm, I'm talking like I'm selling you to come to ACC and do a degree, but our tuition is 20% of the average four-year program in Texas. So you get a lot more bang for your buck at ACC as well. Um, but with that, I'd like to share a screen and show you a little bit of our new building and talk to you a little bit about what's going on there and what's about to happen. Uh, and Albert's a, a huge part of what's about to happen. All right. So let's see, bear with me for one minute. There we go, can everybody see? This is the rendering of our building. Uh, if you go through, oops, I don't want that to happen. If you go through these doors here, all the music is back here. This is called the Paseo. Um, it's also a performance space for us. We have a recital hall to the right, which you'll see in a minute. And this uh, long, stairwell goes up to a long passage on the second floor of the building which takes you to the other side of campus um, and so there's going to be an amphitheater out there in addition to the indoor facilities we have um, to the right of us klru is moving onto our campus and they're going to be filming austin city limits there so we're going to have internships for our students we're going to have a uh, 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 work you know, work study kind of possibilities for our students, which we haven't had before. And uh, so we're just excited about what can happen. There's our parking garage, which is not open yet. It will be uh, in a couple of months. And there's, this is the actual picture. There's our ACC bat. I was hoping you and, mentioned that river bat, Stephen. You know, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we gotta, we gotta, I don't know what a river bat is, but that's who we are, ACC river bats. Um, I don't know if you know this, but they, they held an online voting for students to name the mascot, the bat. And the, the one that won is unpronounceable. It's, it's nothing but consonants. So they call him BR now, I think, was the first two letters of his name, which cannot be pronounced. They should not have put it in the hands of students, I don't think, if they wanted a real name. Anyway, so uh, this is uh, along with our department. There are so many other departments. Culinary Arts is here. This is their uh, like cafeteria. 
they're going to be making the food themselves as part of their classes and study. And it's a really synergistic kind of idea. Every department has top-notch facilities. We're really grateful for that. Um, and it allows us, because so much of what we do at ACC is, is workforce training, not only, uh, you know, in the traditional academic fields in music, we have music business department where our audio engineers and live sound, the people who run music in Austin and elsewhere in Texas, um, they come through the ACC programs. So we're really uh, thrilled about that. This is just an example. The students are gonna be making the meals. They're gonna be the hospitality uh, uh, program is gonna be serving and so forth. And uh, it's gonna be really great. This is a, uh, a depiction before the uh, uh, building was built right through those double doors there on your left is, um, is the music uh, rooms. This is the actual space. There's the actual space as built. Uh, we have, there are really great areas all over the building that aren't specifically for music, but can be used. You know, you could put a little jazz trio or a, or a string quartet on these uh, spots and have music, whoops. I hope you didn't lose your picture. I lost mine for a second there. Um, this is our office. <laughs> uh, and this is our, uh, many of you who've been in Austin and have known people from ACC have not yet met, met Shane Anderson. Shane came in at the same time Albert did. He's our new music department chair. He runs the piano pedagogy uh, program and he's out of UT, taught all over the place, came to us from Nichols State in Louisiana. Shane's a wonderful guy. This is his new piano lab. <clears throat> this is his piano studio where our, uh, our piano majors will be taking. There'll be two pian grands in the room. You see that was taken before it was unpacked. Here is a, the bad theory room, which I'll probably be teaching in. Uh, and here is the good theory room, which has windows. Uh, I will try and schedule myself in there. But these are just a few glimpses of what we got going on. We, uh, we were thrilled because Albert was coming in to build a program, we needed instruments. We've had a jazz program for, for 30 some odd years, but we haven't had the instruments to start uh, uh, a classical program, whether it's chamber ensemble, wind ensemble, concert band or orchestra. So um, through, through uh, both tax dollars, your dollars and grants and things, we uh, have $750,000 worth of brand new instruments at ACC. Um, and this is, it's not pretty. They're all in boxes right there, but this is the room where they're kept. It is kept under lock and key, but our students, many of whom come from high school programs where they rented instruments or the, the, the school provided them instruments don't own their own instruments. And so now we're in a position to, uh, uh, check these instruments out and we're thrilled about that. <clears throat> this is a lobby area for the music recital hall, which is right upstairs. This would be a great place for a jazz ensemble to set up and play, uh, put, you know, artwork on the walls, work it as an art gallery and so forth as a kind of pre-show um, uh, welcome. There is our performance hall at the top of those stairs. The, the theater department is with us. Dance, theater and music are, and music business are all intertwined. Uh, there's a new black box theater, which is ju literally just that, a black box. It's completely flexible. You can build a theater in the round. You can build a, a proscenium stage. You can do whatever you want. Uh, the performance hall, which we're about to go in and see, uh, is, was designed acoustically uh, by a, a firm in Colorado, and we're really looking forward to getting in there and, and playing over this, the second half of our semester here. We're finally going to be able to get in there. All right. This is our new recital hall. <clears throat> um, it seats, uh, for those of you who played at ACC, it seats more people, although it doesn't look like it, seats more people than we had in the old lecture hall. And it's beautiful acoustics. We have a, a, a beautiful Yamaha um, uh, six foot eight grand. No, I, I lied, six foot eight, seven foot six grand um, that can be pulled out of the closet on the right. Um, here's a couple of views. But these are spaces that we can use to host festivals. Um, there are you know, plenty of rehearsal spaces and flexible rooms downstairs. 
So we can put on a jazz festival mm -hmm. now with high school groups. We can host, uh, you know, regional uh, UIL competitions and all of that stuff that we, we never were able to do in the past. So we're really thrilled about that. This in our cousins, music business, performance and technology are, have uh, uh, music business degrees, audio engineering degrees, live sound degrees and so forth. This is their studio. It's being put together there. Uh, sound isolation booths for drums and vocals and so forth. It's a beautiful space. This is the band hall before we started using it. It's currently a storage room there, but that's the new band hall where the world famous jazz ensemble, uh, ACC jazz ensemble now rehearses. Um, you know, we've had, it's been so long since we had a full jazz ensemble. I can't wait till next fall when we can start that up again. And uh, uh, Kat, we're looking forward to playing the Texas Community Music Festival again as soon as we can. So uh, I'm just gonna flash through. There's a lot of spaces for students to hang out, to a talk. This is a presentation room, which we can use also for master classes. The front rows of tables fold up and collapse and we can roll a piano down the ramp here on your right. Um, master classes and so uh, seminars, Wednesday seminars. The campus is really designed to be inclusive, whether you're at ACC or not. This is a radio, television and films podcast studio, which is at a major intersection of buildings so that you can uh, can watch while they're broadcasting. There are uh, study rooms for students. This is our, one of the RTF's uh, studios with the green screen. And this is a picture of the building they're building just south to us. It's going to be completed uh, probably this coming month in April. Um, and the top, top rows uh, of floors are for ACC uh, administrators, higher ups, but the bottom floor and the basement uh, will hold the uh, studio and auditorium where Austin City Limits is going to be uh, filmed from now on. They're thrilled to be out there. Uh, there's going to be a real synergy between their programs and our departments, and we're really looking forward to that. So I know I'm blabbing on as if I just had a new baby, uh, and many of you don't, <laughs> aren't, aren't that interested, so I'm going to stop now but I really just kind of wanted to take a moment to get the word out. Since we've opened during the pandemic, you know, we've had a few news stories, but nothing really to show you guys yet. And so we would love to host uh, ACWI um, at some point when, when the campus is reopened, have you guys come out, check it out, play it, sound, sound out the rooms um, and do some kind of collaboration with you guys and ACC students. ACC ensembles, it would be just a fabulous way to connect. That's the biggest, I think the, the most uh, exciting thing about our new facilities is that it allows us to make these kind of connections that we've never had before. So we're really looking forward to uh, inviting you guys out at some point. That's my spiel. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Yeah. I mean, it's it's really really nice. I mean, at least from from I will tell you that from from an Austin taxpayer's point of view, of the few, of the few things that I think that these days that 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 our city has done with with our money, I think that this is, I, I think that that's fantastic. That's great. That ensures really the the, uh, the 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 livelihood of the music program at ACC for a long long time. I mean, that's, yeah, it's you know, like I said, we are in a situation literally in Austin, Texas, where we can build a, you know, a premier community college music program that, that's, that's on par with anything else in the country. Um, we have the, you know, we have the faculty, they come from North Texas, they come from Texas, they come from all over great music programs, Indiana and so forth. Um, so we've got the folks uh, and uh, the students now have room to come in and explore the new programs. Albert is here to to kind of orchestrate, so to speak, the, the classical side. And, and it's, a, it's a really exciting time to be at ACC. I'm glad you approve uh, of your taxpayer money uh, going to it. I, I really do think it's a, you know, our next, uh, the next phase of ACC uh, Highland Campus is a performing arts center, similar to Bass Concert Hall at UT, a 2000 seat auditorium which will bring in touring shows on the weekends, 
Um, again, it gives our students opportunities, internships, whether they're helping, uh, you know, uh, theater folks setting up scenery, uh, unloading trucks, you know, doing the roadie, roadie gigs or just ushering performances. Um, there's going to be a whole lot happening. Uh, and it's centrally located. So most of Austin, you know, a lot of my students uh, when we were at Northridge would um, would come up on the bus. Well, if their connections were running on time, it would take them an hour and a half just to get up to campus. And then they got another hour and a half to go back home at night. That's three hours out of their day. And uh, so our students are very dedicated, but ACC built this campus with the agreement that there would be a, a, a Metro stop, which is right across the street from the music building. So you just hop on uh, unless you live east or west of Austin. It's only north and south right now, but um, yeah, that's how I'm going to be commuting. I live up in Cedar Park. I've got a park and ride five minutes from my house. I'm going to hop on the train every morning and ride into campus and come back in the evening. So there's going to be a lot more access for the community in general as well. You know, I've, I've taught in a lot of a lot of institutions in my 30 year career as an educator. I tell you, ACC has done more for their students than any other institutions I've ever been with. They really do care about their students and they offer so many opportunities for uh, for the underserved community that I, I can't I can't speak highly enough. And that's one of the reasons why I came from a four year institution to commute to Austin Community College is because I believe I believe in their philosophy. I believe in in the, in the diversity that that Austin's um, uh, the Austin Community College envisions our, our school to be. And I think these facilities are are very unique to community colleges. Most community colleges don't have the budget to do things like this. And it is a once in a lifetime opportunity um, for us, you know, to uh, to experience this this new this new uh, this new facility. And and I can't wait, you know, until everything opens up and then we can open open everybody um, and welcome everybody with open arms. And we would love to have a um, a community event where we invite all people like you to come in and, and tour the facilities. Mm -hmm. We hope that our dean would support it with, with a little <laughs> wine and cheese, you know, uh, uh, and, um, and make it a little classy event for us. But we would cer certainly would love it. Yeah. yeah. Sachs, we'll love it. Ab absolutely. So hang in there, guys. And we would love to, to keep you in, uh, continually updated about ACC. And as soon as it opens up, that invitation is coming towards your way. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Mike, Robert, yes, Thomas. So we're we're kind of concluding towards the end. I, I can't believe we actually went through the whole entire evening. It's nine thirty. <laughs> Thank you so much, all of you. And I'm looking at hardly anybody at, at checked out. You know, the same right. amount of people here, there are the same amount of people that that continue to listen. And we certainly really enjoyed tonight's evening with all of you. And it's I nice wait. getting to uh, see some faces and some names that I haven't seen yeah. in quite some time. It's nice to see some new faces too. I'm looking forward to meeting everybody um, when this when we get through all of this. Let's let's get our instruments out and start practicing. Huh? <laughs> oh no, not that. <laughs> Anything but that. I'm, I'm getting my accordion out right now, so you better hang up. <laughs> you want to start listening? To, if you start listening to twos, make a list for Robert and Thomas twos that you want to play. Right? Steven, your your middle name should be Flaco Jimenez. So Steven Flaco Jimenez Sauters. There, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Well, thank you Perfect. so much for having us. It's, it's been a real pleasure thrill and, and certainly a lot of fun for us to get together. So we're going to be working on some of the things that you had talked about. Um, you know, we'd love to start a repair class for us, for some of you guys. And we'd love, we'd love for us to uh, interact with a little more programming research. And we're certainly re research re repair shops for you. That are open in the area. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Thanks yeah. for having us out. We appreciate it. Uh, Thank y'all. Yep. It was a great, uh, great presentation. Thank y'all so much.